Hi again, this is Mara Fine, Program Manager for Member Services at the Jewish Funders Network. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us today to talk with Golly Cooks about Leading Edge, the Alliance for Excellence in Jewish Leadership. Um, at the Jewish Funders Network, we're committed to working together to improve the Jewish community, and part of that is working with leaders to improve their experience on a day-to-day -day basis. So with that in mind, um, we spoke with Golly Cooks, and we're having her speak to us about what Leading Edge is, what it's about, where it came from, um, and how it's going to improve uh, the way that our community works. So without further ado, Golly, take it away. Wonderful. Thank you, Mayrav. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to uh, continue partnering with the Jewish Funders Network on many different uh, aspects of our work and also engaging with the wonderful membership and the growing membership of JFN as we all try to support and build a thriving Jewish communal uh, world ecosystem and structure. So as Mayrav said, we at Leading Edge, uh, the formerly the Jewish Leadership Pipelines Alliance, are very much focused on how to build the kind of Jewish nonprofit sector that is poised, able, ready, and willing to do the most important work uh, that we have in our society. And uh, what I want to take us through today is share a little bit about Leading Edge, really just a little bit, and then take a deeper dive into one of the verticals that we're working on, uh, a program called Leading Places to Work that is all about workplace culture and a first step we're taking in that direction. And if uh, there, uh, I'm not sure if there's a, an opportunity for any sort of Q&A. Um, I'm happy to engage if that comes up uh, on this call or certainly after uh, as we, um, as we uh, take next steps after this call and kind of move forward with our programs. So I uh, just want to confirm, um, are people seeing, and maybe Mayrav, you can see it, the, the slide that says a bit, a bit about Leading Edge? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, fantastic. Um, okay, so a bit about Leading Edge. Uh, we are a uh, really ca came to life because of this third bullet over here, which is essentially uh, the problem was uh, that uh, different uh, funding entities um, were recognizing that uh, we were having a hard time as a community finding the right liter leaders, really capable leaders, uh, for open positions in our uh, in our organizations. So if we if we take the entire ecosystem of uh, the U.S. Uh, Jewish nonprofit sector, there are uh, we estimate about 9,500 Jewish nonprofit organizations in the United States. We know that uh, from different monographs, and JFN did one several years ago, where we asked the leaders of these organizations, how long are you going to stay in your position, and what do you see as some of the uh, the biggest kinds of issues that are facing you? And they said, well, the, the overwhelming majority said we are most likely going to be retiring or leaving in the next five to seven years, and therefore leadership, leadership really in succession is one of the, the biggest kinds of issues that we as a community are facing, and certainly uh, as a result of some of the demographic shifts and some of the other contributing kind of shifts in our society. So with that problem in mind, uh, a group of funders uh, commissioned Bridgepan to do a report to basically answer the question, uh, you know, why is it so hard to find leaders for Jewish nonprofits? And uh, they uh, uncovered two themes, and this was actually uh, a plenary panel discussion, I think two years ago now at, at the Jewish Funders Network Conference, where these, uh, these foundation heads and Bridgespan started talking about these two themes, which is one, why is it hard to find leaders? Because we as Jewish nonprofits as a sector, we really have not done a sufficient job of developing the kind of talent that we already have in our pipeline. That was kind of number one. And then number two, that uh, as a sector, we kind of have an image problem in that many of the interviews and the research that was done by Bridgespan for this report uncovered a, uh, a kind of a, a tarnished reputation almost of our sector um, and different uh, different uh, views that we have um, steep bureaucracies and and uh, and a lot of politics and uh, unforgiving work and all of the things that um, came up uh, in the interviews that really led to a 
um, kind of a, a weak value proposition for our sector. So what these these founding partners essentially who asked the question, you know, why is it so hard to find leaders for our organizations came together, and you can see some of some of them uh, on this slide, really a cross-sector of uh, the leading funders in our society, and put together this uh, really, are, we are a nascent, uh, really nascent entity, and um, we are here as leading edge to create a forum for the field to address these leadership pipeline issues. And that means that we want to encourage coordination among Jewish nonprofits. We want to partner with funders in supporting specific programs, and we're going to get into that. Uh, and ultimately, we really want to build a more robust uh, pipeline that will flow, um, a pipeline of high-quality leadership, I should say, that will flow um, into our Jewish nonprofits, creating a more vibrant sector. So that's the that's the kind of backdrop, and the way that we see our work is kind of in three buckets. One is uh, having to kind of educate ourselves and really organizing the field about uh, talent development kinds of issues. So we started with a Bridgeman report. Uh, they're going to be we're we're in the process of mapping the field, understanding who is doing what in order to support talent in our field. Uh, there's going to be some benchmarking work that we're going to be doing, and then hopefully sharing that with the community so that we can facilitate conversation. Uh, the second is really championing this issue, and this is something that, you know, in partnership with JFN and others, really elevating this issue of leadership as, as one that is not a nice to have, but a need to have. And so really talking about the value of investing in people, getting better results as a result of investing in people, all those types of issues uh, are, is also very much uh, part of our core. Uh, and also talking about the bright spots. We, one of the things that the Bridgeman Report did uncover, and is no su surprise to any of us, is that we absolutely have tremendous talent in our ecosystem. Let us shine a light on that. Let's, uh, you know, I kind of like to say, let's stop fetching about everything and let's start gvelling a little bit about some of the stuff that are that's going well, because some of the stuff is working, and let's understand why it's working and perhaps how we can amplify that. The third pillar is really intervention. So uh, this really goes to the programs that we are going to be launching, again, in the endeavor to really build a platform and uh, test some of the needs that we have seen in the field. And you'll see that there's a CEO onboarding program that we just uh, opened applications for, and this is for new CEOs of any type of Jewish uh, organizational uh, or organization, and it's a, a cohort-based leadership development program to kind of help maximize those first, the first part of tenure for these, uh, for these new CEOs as more new CEOs are coming in. Uh, we have a lay leadership commission that's actually we're partnering also with JFN on and trying to really facilitate a conversation around the role of philanthropy in helping to build great organizations and really support talent on their quest to, great, to greater results. And the third is leading places to work, and that's going to be really the focus of our um, of more of the second part of uh, this kind of presentation, and that all has to do with workplace culture. And this slide has a lot of text on it. Wanted to give you a sense of kind of how we're working some of these um, these pillars, and um, and you will see some of the uh, perhaps. Uh, some familiar and uh, hopefully some new individuals that we're really trying to get uh, capture kind of multi generational and a diverse uh, set of um, expertise and um, uh, real contribution to some of these um, uh, programs that we're going to be running and we are launching. Uh, so, within the leading places to work. Um, one of the things that um, we keep asking ourselves and, and has come up within uh, the Bridgespan report among uh, and among the probably 400 cups of coffee at this point that I've had with uh, different uh, professionals and lay leaders who are very much committed to our community. They want to make sure that we're doing the best work that we can on behalf of society, on behalf of our community, on behalf of our uh, local, uh, local shtetl, if you will. Um, and what came up again and again is the organizational development and structure kind of element to our organizations and how sometimes the structure, sometimes uh, the, the lack of structure, the overstructure, um, the, the culture, the real culture, the way of doing uh, and the environment within 
our organizations uh, are the impediment to our being able to get our best results. And this is not something that's unique to the Jewish community. This is something that uh, management gurus have espoused for many, many, um, in many ways, in many different, uh, many different contexts. This is Peter Drucker, kind of a, a management guru and really the father of modern uh, business management, which basically, you know, he says you can have the absolute best vision, you can have the absolute best plan if you don't have the right kind of culture in place. That plan will never see the light of day, and therefore culture eats strategy for breakfast. If you have a strategic plan and it's wonderful, but we don't, you don't have the team in place and the different systems in place in order to, uh, to really be able to execute on it, it's not going to see the light of day, and then so it doesn't matter if you have a strategic plan. And so that really got us focusing on workplace culture. So a bit more about uh, the Leading Places to Work initiative and why we even took it upon ourselves to do that. The, the, the real reason has to do with our ability to, going back to the initial kind of ground zero, why did Leading Edge become uh, an organization and what's the problem we're working to solve, we're really talking about recruitment, retention, support of excellent professionals in our ecosystem and the way that we draw connection between that ability to draw in the best talent and really empower the best talent to maximize its potential in a great workplace culture. And that's really the focus of this Leading Places to Work kind of um, initiative. So the way that we are, are trying to uh, really support organizations in creating great workplaces is first, we want to understand where we are today. We, we actually, the first step that we took for um, leading places to work is we first did a literature review, honestly, of, of you know, what in the world is a great place to work. Um, and it's not uh, free food and different perks like Google would potentially have you believe. It, it's much more about a, a culture where there is a real foundation of trust and respect so that you trust that your employees are going to be able to do their best work and are going to get their results, and you entrust them with the kind of resources to be able to actually get their work done. So it's not just enough that they are uh, an employee is very passionate about their work, and many of our uh, of our the people in our organizations are, but are they actually able to make those ideas and, and actually do their best work? So it's both of those kind of engagement, satisfaction, and enablement of uh, your ability to do your best work. So we we kind of did a definition uh, of the ideal. Okay, this is a great place to work, and then we took a step back and we said, all right, well let's start. Let's understand where we are today. And then we'll, we'll understand well, what is needed in order to help organizations on this journey to becoming great places to work. And it really is a journey. Uh, we, we kind of like to say that it's, it's much more of a practice. It's, uh, it's about the practice and not necessarily the destination. It's you know, kind of like yoga. It's like you're not going to be perfect. You're going to have to keep practicing at it. So our first step in that is um, – we wanted to pilot a survey where we asked the people. We basically asked the people, we want to understand how engaged are you in your work, how able are you to do your work, and what are some of the things that are going well and where are the potential gaps in your endeavor to become a very high-performing uh, individual in your organization. And again, our hypothesis is Organizations are made of people, and therefore they're the sum of people. So you ask one person, and for their opinion, and um, and their their viewpoint, and then you take the aggregate, and you start getting a sense of really what's happening on the ground. So we just last week um, piloted um, an online survey that we partnered with the Hay Group, which is a an organizational development. Uh, consulting firm uh, that's done global work, uh, corporate sector, they've done some work for the federal government, they've done a lot of work for the nonprofit sector. And it is a very, uh, the, the online survey is a very classic 55 question you ask of employees 
where they are in the moment, how able are you to do your best work, how satisfied are you with your current position, and, um, and, and other kind of nuanced kinds of questions. The, um, the kinds of uh, organizations, I should say, the, the scope of the pilot, and it really is just a pilot, it's just a beginning. So we were able to get 55 organizations and about 4,900 employees to be part of this pilot. Uh, we actually estimate, and it really is a gross estimation, um, that uh, 4,900, it's almost 5,000 actually employees that are a part of this, um, that is about 5% of the total number of professionals working in Jewish organizations in the United States. So we kind of wanted to take a little slice. Now you can see these are the these are the organizations who are part of the pilot. Um, you will see that the Jewish Funders Network is actually on there. If uh, we take kind of a you know deeper dive into who who really makes part is part of this uh, um, of this pilot group, this is kind of the distribution um, of of them, and a little bit more about um, just the the pilot group. Um, by organizations, so we really try to get some umbrella organizations in there, um, uh, so federations, and, and uh, we actually, if we go back actually to the, the actual list, you will see that there's the Orthodox Union, the Union for Reform Judaism, um, the conservative movement as well, and um, um, so we really try to, to get a kind of a, a big umbrella, kind of horizontal slice from our community. Um, this is just another another breakdown of kind of what what kind of um, how the pilot breaks down by um, by employees, and what we're hoping is to get more data around a baseline data around how are we doing when it comes to employee engagement, and also collect more data around um, some of the the HR kind of practices that are out there, and to what extent they're effective in creating the kind of environment that is what we would call kind of a leading place to work. So just two very quick data points um, and several others that are going to be coming in, in other slides. Of the 55 organizations that are on the, on the pilot, we did ask, um, does your workplace have a formal flexibility policy? And we, we really we want to continue and, and hopefully build upon and really enrich the work that Schiffer Brosnick and Advancing Women Professionals have done around uh, formal flex time, around parental leave, um, and really understanding that those are uh, benefits that could really go a long way because they really speak to trust. You, you are trusting your employees to get their work done, and that doesn't necessarily mean they have to be at their desk in order to do it. That's, that's one you know, potential, potential way of lo looking at formal flex time or, or um, you know, paid parental leave and all of that. So you can see that um, from the 55 organizations, the formal flex time policy is almost 50-50. You know, 50% have them, 50% don't. Um, and we're, we're going to dig a little bit deeper into some of that later on as we get more results from the survey. Uh, we also wanted to, to understand more around um, family leave. And, um, and you can see that there's kind of an 80-20. There is unpaid family leave um, that, uh, or additional policies um, in place among 80% of the organizations um, in addition to just the, the minimum uh, six weeks of unpaid family leave that is part of um, U.S. law now. And, um, and again, I, that, that's very much... I would say building building upon what Schiffer Brosnick has has and her team have done to get this really onto the radar screen and show the value of uh, having these kinds of policies in place for employees as a as a way of um, entrusting them to do their best work. The other things that we asked for were just what are the other kind of HR policies of note. Um, and I should mention that we're basically going to once the the um, the results are in, we're going to see which organizations have kind of which policies. And there's a, an algorithm that um, the Hague Group has to see um, how much of these are actually key drivers uh, to employee satisfaction and engagement. Um, so that, that too, we'll, we'll be having in about um, um, a month or so. 
Uh, and you can see over here there, there are kind of you know five different buckets of other policies of note. There's a vacation and time off kind of thing. So you will see there. There's some organizations that there's no work Fridays. There's some organizations where you can take a sabbatical after um, every seven years of employment. There's summer hours um, and paid time for a volunteer service. Um, some really interesting kind of creative uh, creative time uh, allotments. Uh, there are also are uh, several organizations mentioned um, some sort of tuition assistance or, or some sort of um, professional development budget for their employees. Uh, we have not followed up yet to see how much of it is actually utilized, but uh, it is it is on the books formally in uh, budget. Um, the uh, the other types of uh, perks had to deal with um, some sort of um, abatement on tuition uh, since we we do anticipate having some uh, some more data around salary and benefits and the cost really of um, being a Jewish professional and wanting to take advantage of uh, a Jewish life, which means uh, potentially uh, synagogue membership or uh, camp or day school, and you can see that some of the some of the organizations actually have abatement of Jewish communal services and child care. Um, and, um, and that was kind of interesting to see, and there, there really is um, some creativity among some of these organizations. And, um, and then the other perks had to do, a lot of them had to deal with um, appreciation. Um, so um, the, uh, the, milestone, the milestone service acknowledgments, that was something that, that kind of like different appreciation um, awards that came up again and again among the organizations, and um, and uh, if we see that some of these elements are uh, more effective than others based on this algorithm, it'll be really interesting to kind of dig a little a little bit deeper into what these organizations do, and and maybe um, help them share some of that with our community, and also take some other uh, models from other communities and other organizations that do this to see um, how how effective it is on um, employee satisfaction, morale, effectiveness, uh, productivity. So that's the, that's the other. Um, the, the, within the survey, just, um, uh, just to dig a little bit deeper in this, the, the reason why we're very excited about this is because for the first time, really, uh, we are taking a very fat or horizontal slice of Jewish organizations, very different types of organizations, and are giving them a way to analyze themselves and, and compare themselves against the aggregate of the other 54 organizations in the same way. So even though we've got federations and foundations and JCCs and several congregations and a day school and what have you, we are able to almost like take the temperature of these organizations in a similar way and to understand how employees are experiencing their day-to-day -day and their role and therefore how satisfied and potentially effective are they in those roles. And so this is, this is one of the things that uh, we're going to be sharing back with the, the community is really thinking about what are some of the trends that are, that are bubbling forth with this beginning baseline of, um, of you know, base, almost 5,000 employees and seeing where are their clusters of strengths, where are their clusters of weaknesses, uh, who are some of the bright spots in there, uh, and what might we be able to learn from one another, as well as comparing ourselves against the general nonprofit sector, uh, since Hay Group has a, a really a, a deep um, and plentiful um, uh, employee engagement results from nonprofits in the general community. So this is the kind of this is the kind of view of organizations are going to be able to see. Okay, well, on employee engagement, you know, let's say uh, Hillel, that's one of the organizations. Let's say we were in '82, the aggregate was '85. Okay, we well, may be a little bit lower, or something like that. Um, and hopefully, that will not only help inform Hillel internally, but also be able to kind of connect uh, connect the the organizations among each other and, and potentially break down some silos that are uh, very much prevalent in, in, uh, in our community. And, and one of the places that we hope to also have a little bit of an impact is, is learning across different types of organizations and not just deeper within the same type of organization. 
So in terms of a timeline for, for all of this, you know, we're really in the thick right now of the survey. Uh, the survey launched on February 2nd. It is closing next Friday, the 19th. Uh, we have had a very, very strong response rate um, and uh, are going to be taking March and April to um, really march to look at the results and understand them better and then help organizations to make sense of them. We are going to also share the results with the community and then think about, okay, well, what's next? This really is the first step of a journey. Uh, we also know that there are certain organizations that may need uh, it's going to have to be kind of a mass customized uh, kind of approach to what organizations may need in order to become better places to work and uh, what are the different interventions that might be needed. So for example, you know, Leading Edge is very, very much committed to, uh, to these ne next steps. Uh, and next steps might, might take the form of creating additional tools that might be helpful for specific areas where we see an opportunity to grow or potentially some uh, very intense pro bono consulting for organizations that are ready to uh, potentially take a deeper kind of uh, process into making their organizations better. Uh, we've been talking about potential peer groups and, and um, uh, different uh, communities of practice that might come up and, and really help facilitate conversations among colleagues who can learn from one another and also learn from um, outside of our community about how organizations can continue to work toward empowering their teams, really investing in them so that we can get the best results and be the, uh, the kind of community that is able to maximize people's potential so that we can get uh, really deep impact in the work that we're doing. So that's that's kind of the the framework for where we where we are right now with at least um, leading places to work, and we see this as as um, as the pilot and the first step in a, a holistic approach to uh, building a richer field and, and really cultivating some of the um, some of the the strengths that we will uncover and. Uh, and also hopefully helping to identify some gaps that we might be able to address. And, and the, the reason why we're very excited about actually this kind of method is because it is very data-driven in that uh, Hay Group has done this for 30 years. They've perfected their uh, survey in a way that um, is, is very rigorous and, and, uh, um, and also malleable so that uh, organizations have been able to really isolate uh, different areas that have been diagnosed by this employee engagement survey and really take action on it and that has improved organizational performance. Um, so that, that kind of concludes the, uh, the, uh, the um, different elements of where we are uh, with Leading Edge, I'm happy to. Um, I'm kind of scrolling back um, on uh, on some of these slides to um, um, to see if there are any questions or anything more that um, any information that uh, potentially could be helpful to kind of fill in. If there are um, any comments on maybe what resonated, would love to hear from whoever's on the call. And uh, and if not, we can also uh, um, end this early. Thank you so much, Gali, for explaining to us what the work is, which is um, quite a bit of work. Sounds like you guys are really making moves. I already filled out my survey, so ah, I'm right. part of the solution, <laughs> not part of the problem. Um, so thank you guys for being on the call. Everyone's been unmuted, so if you have any questions and you want to ask them on the call, feel free to do that now. You can also type them to me if you don't want to that's also allowed. OK. 
Okay. Any questions coming in or any? Uh, nothing's coming in, but I do have one question that I think maybe would be helpful. Um, as far as you're looking towards next steps, if you're looking at that last slide where it's you're looking towards what you're going to be doing, right? Mm -hmm. um, are you all waiting to see what information comes in to determine how you're going to take action? Or are there, are there steps that are being taken at the moment to sort of understand how we can take some of this information and move forward? How are organizations engaging with that uh, yeah. separately? Yeah, really, really important point. We're kind of doing both. So this is the survey is we're very interested in seeing what kinds of trends and what types of surprises and not surprises come as a result. We do have some hypotheses that we, uh, that we have put forth. And when I say we, uh, I should have mentioned, we have a, uh, a, a task force, basically a subcommittee of the board, which includes uh, non-board members who have really taken on this leading places to work work and are really thinking about how can we support Jewish organizations to become the best places of work that they can be. So within those conversations, we, we've we already identified certain areas that are just questionable, and what we will do about them has not been decided yet, but I'll give you an example. Um, so we know, uh, I, I mentioned there are 4,900 uh, employees that are taking this survey. And the beautiful thing about it is that now we are able to capture a lot of data around uh, these employees before even we, we asked for their attitudes. And there have been some interesting kind of data points that we have found as a result. For example, there are 4,900 uh, employees who are taking this survey. Out of those 4,900, there are over 2,100 unique job titles for those roles, meaning one person has a specific job title. Now, totally fine to have you know, a director of awesomeness or whatever it is. Job titles, in, in many ways, especially if you're going to ask millennials, they don't matter and they can be quirky and fun. The question that then we ask organizations are, is that somehow uh, attributed to, on the back end, are there bands of different seniority levels? How is it structured so that you can be a director of awesomeness, but you can also, from an HR perspective or from a human capital kind of strategy perspective, know that director level is a certain role, responsibility, potentially salary band, that kind of stuff. So when we look at our, our field, we know that it's uh, incredibly creative. There are 9,500 Jewish organizations. They're, they kind of have uh, – there are a range of different industries that we, that we work in. You know, there's a health and human services, there are congregations and different educational, there are museums, there are you know, various uh, – we're a microcosm of the entire nonprofit sector because we just happen to be you know, parochially Jewish. And yet, when we look at some of that fragmentation and some of that diversity, that might actually pose a problem to the talent, the recruitment and retention question. Because if we have 2,100 different job titles and we're not sure what those roles entail, then advising a young professional or professional in general on what are the roles that best meet his or her skills, experience, interests, opportunities becomes very difficult. And so we've been asking questions around career mapping as a result or career passing as a result and gateways and pathways within our, our ecosystem when we're not quite sure what types of rules there are in our ecosystem and, um, and potentially you know, the, the job title thing, it's, it's kind of a fun factoid, and it could be meaningless in certain ways, and it's also potentially a symptom of something greater. So we're looking at different, different aspects of that, and there mm -hmm. are, um, I can tell you in terms of leading places to work, one of the things that we are looking to, uh, to take action on, irrespective of the survey results, is um, the issue of salary and benefits in our ecosystem in that we know that this is an issue um, 
when I say this, the, the lack of information and transparency around different types of salary bands and uh, from an employee and an employer and a job seeker and an um, employee, employee seeker perspective, there's a lot of um, – there's a lack of transparency around that. And when we're talking about creating great places to work, uh, one of the, the main ingredients is one of trust and transparency in, in a with, – within reason, right? There, there's some state secrets and trade secrets and whatnot that maybe you want to put under lock and key. But when it comes to you know, specifically understanding the value of an individual and how to translate that into uh, different tiers of – responsibilities and therefore salaries, um, that's something that uh, is very much a characteristic of a great place to work. And uh, there are certain examples of that good practice within our organizations. It's not sector-wide. And so that could potentially be something that comes out um, of our leading places to work kind of um, uh, not only the survey, but also the the conversations that um, that we've been having, and also some of the other data that we've been looking at. Um, so there's there are those types of questions around how we might be able to organize the field uh, based on and, and shed more light, honestly, uh, on the field based on what we're learning from leading places to work, just from the literature review and from the process of really thinking about this pilot and launching the pilot. And then in terms of next steps, we are waiting um, to see what we get as, a, as, as this pilot uh, rolls out and we start getting some, some data. And my sense is we're going to be surprised in certain ways, and uh, in good and bad ways, most likely. And, um, and also, you know, we, we, are, we do know that this is uh, it's a very limited pilot. Um, we the way that we got to the 55 organizations is it was almost like a friends and family counter kind of round. Um, we have a 15-person a board and um, and went to them first and said, do you guys want to participate? And then let's think about who else we can uh, participate in this pilot, understanding that this is an experiment and um, mm -hmm. they're going to have to help us kind of think about number one, is this a good tool? Number two, how can we make it better? Number three, how can we make it available for the sector? So to answer your question in a very, very long-winded way, uh, yes, there are certain things that we're looking at right now, irrespective of the results, that we are going to move forward with and, uh, and dig deeper on. And then we're, we are waiting for the survey to see what are some specific next steps, interventions, and additional uh, things that we might be able to do in order to um, help support Jewish organizations as they um, look at their workplace culture. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gali. Um, if we don't have any additional questions, I think we're going to close. This will, of course, be available to all of you. Uh, it's recorded. It will be posted on our website, so you can feel free to take a look at it again if there were any colleagues of yours who you think would be interested to forward it along to them. And we're really interested in continuing to see what is happening with Leading Edge and how uh, you're affecting change in, in this community, and thank you again so much for your hard work and for your time today. So everyone have a great day. Uh, don't know where you are, but enjoy your weather, whatever it is, and we'll, we'll speak soon. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.